Our first speaker today is Neil Caparoso. He got his MD <coughs> from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey in 1980. He did a residency in internal medicine, and then he joined NCI as an oncology fellow in the medicine branch. He uh, became a biotechnology fellow in the environmental epidemiology branch at NCI. And then he became chief of the genetic epidemiology branch uh, in 2011. He's now in the occupational and environmental studies branch, and he's going to talk to us about epidemiology. Neil. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. And uh, I'm going to give you a rapid uh, introduction to epidemiology. which is a population perspective on cancer. So many of you are clinicians, but uh, epidemiologists work about, worry about the population as a whole. So I'm gonna cover uh, what is epidemiology, what are the accomplishments, what can go wrong or what are the challenges, uh, a case study of what can go really wrong, and then I'll uh, take a peek at the future. So what is epidemiology? And I looked for one slide that could kind of convey what epidemiology tries to do. And I think this slide captures it. If you allow market forces to tell us what's good for us and what's bad for us, you just have to go back a few decades and you can see that advertisers used images of doctors to sell us cigarettes. Okay, and probably the best established association in all of epidemiology is that smoking causes lung cancer. So we really need a scientific discipline that steps in and examines the causes of cancer. And if you say to yourself, well, that was then, what about now? Um, there are potential causes of cancer and human disease that maybe today uh, we don't really suspect. And I think Halloween's a good time to raise the issue of sugar. So I will uh, come back to this uh, a little bit later in the talk. Okay, so what is epidemiology? It's concerned with the human population and it's an observational science like astronomy, for example. And contrast that with experimental science. In epidemiology, we're not allowed to administer potentially harmful treatments to people. We can't assign 50 people to the smoking group and 50 to the non-smoking group, but we have to observe uh, their current status. So that's why it's um, called an observational science. Um, the work of epidemiology takes place in NCI, in the Division of Cancer, Epidemiology, and Genetics. And uh, I'm currently working in the Occupation and Environmental Epidemiology branch, where we're focused on environmental and occupational causes of cancer. So um, epidemiology uh, in DCEG uh, has contributed to regulatory changes, uh, clinical practice, um, and preventive interventions. And I'll give a few specific examples as we go forward. Uh, just to orient you to where we are, um, NCI is part of uh, NIH. And our division, the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics, is intramural. Now, 85% of the dollars go extramurally to grants, but the intramural uh, part is a very important uh, component. And uh, in the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics, there are a number of branches, uh, in addition to ours, which is, of course, the most important, um, there are branches concerned with metabolic factors uh, like nutrition and hormones, um, infection, genetics, statistics, uh, radiation. Uh, and our work uh, focuses on the environmental and genetic causes of cancer in the population, um, high quality, high impact, uh, value-added research. There are studies that are both national and international in scope. And um, we have a lot of scientific partnerships with laboratories investigating the molecular epidemiology of cancer. 
The next speaker, uh, Brid Ryan, will be focusing on some of the uh, health disparities that are key in international studies. So uh, just to mention, our studies are worldwide. So we have uh, investigations in China, and this has been for decades, um, pretty much all over the world, including places you might not suspect, like Iran, uh, through South America, Africa, and of course, uh, all across the United States. So there's a nice uh, website that you can visit and you can learn about our specific studies and the investigators and there's a lot of great information there and also tools. So um, breast, melanoma, colorectal cancer assessment tools. So back to uh, observational versus experimental. Um, as I've mentioned, epidemiologists are ethically prohibited from performing experiments on people. So we observe large populations and then relate their outcomes to what people do to key exposures. Um, the weakness of observational studies was something that was exploited by the tobacco companies when the first um, studies emerged relating tobacco to cancer. They said, well, this is really not have a firm basis. Um, and how do you know that it's not smoking, but it's the personality. Uh, smokers have a more adventurous, outgoing personality. And that may be what really causes the lung cancer um, association. And so epidemiologists from the very beginning have been uh, concerned with establishing causality. So I'll give some examples of that in a second. Uh, generally, there's a hierarchy of studies in terms of the strength of establishing evidence of causality. And the weakest studies are anecdotes. In other words, I heard somebody uh, ate wheat germ and lived to be 90. Okay, that's nice, but um, the second level would be small, unrepresentative samples, uh, samples of convenience, so to speak. Then uh, cross-sectional studies, also known as prevalence studies. The problem with these kinds of studies is that they're biased by differential survival. Case control studies, uh, and of course there's a range of quality in all these kinds of studies, uh, generally the next level. Cohort studies have the advantage of identifying a large group prospectively and following them uh, over time for different outcomes. And so they tend to avoid selection bias to some degree that plagues uh, case control studies. And finally, randomized clinical trials are thought to be the highest uh, level of evidence. So the goals of epidemiology, we wanna identify the causes of cancer. We wanna quantify risks. Um, epidemiologists are very concerned with public health and public health services, how much, how much is needed, how many cases of breast cancer are go we going to have next year, and what kinds of health services do we need to, um, to support them. Uh, we want to identify syndromes, trends, and epidemic, and we want to understand mechanisms. Epidemiologists tend to emphasize prevention. So uh, think about vaccines, think about clean water, uh, smoking cessation. This approach tends to be much cheaper uh, than treatment. And so it's uh, really, in that way, a very effective and, and good approach. We want to eliminate disease at the source. It generally requires um, education, uh, communication. There's a big uh, downside to prevention. And that's a political issue. Um, the issue is this, you can't go to Congress and point to all the cases of a condition that you've prevented. I mean, you can show the evidence, but it's not like you have grateful patients that are saying yes, because you gave me the latest treatment, I'm now alive. Um, you have just have a lot of people without disease. So uh, you have to rely on statistics and they're just inherently less 
uh, Germanic than treatment. Um, so it's, sometimes it's harder to get funding for public health, even though it is more effective. It also takes time. So if we eliminate an exposure now, it may take decades for this to show up in health statistics. And finally, epidemiologists don't tend to get Nobel Prizes. So um, this is kind of a downside for the individuals. And it, um, you know, it's not a big deal, but uh, really for the scientists that identified tobacco as a carcinogen and did those first studies, I think that you could argue that they've saved more lives than virtually any other um, intervention you could imagine, and they certainly are deserving. Okay. Epidemiologists are concerned with bias, systematic deviation from the truth. And this could be an entire uh, one hour talk easily. Um, but I'm just gonna give you one example. And that is that um, you can have a bias, it's extremely common uh, in virtually any study based on the participation rate. And uh, this is because if you only have a small proportion of people who are eligible for a study participating, you don't know if they're really representative of the target population. Um, and they may not be generalizable to the general uh, population. So that's a concern. And if I was to ask you uh, an example of a gigantic study like UK Biobank in, the, in England, what percentage of eligible people uh, actually participate in that study? Um, the percentage turns out to be extremely small, about 5% or less. So that population is probably biased. Um, and although it is somewhat generalizable and we use that study all the time, it's very, very difficult to get a uh, highly generalizable population. So as one example, um, my group did a large case control study. At the time we did this, it was the largest case control study in the world of lung cancer, 2,000 cases and 2,000 controls. And uh, when we initially did a phone survey, this was in Milan, Italy, to determine whether people would agree to the study, only 30% of the population uh, of folks that we called said, yeah, we'd participate in that study. And um, our site visitors at the time said, no, 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 we can't do that. We, you know, we can't have that. You either have to increase the participation rate or we're not going to give you the $12 million you need for the study. So we spent a year and we did invitation letters, follow up by phone, advertisements, uh, offered them cash, got a letter from their physician and offered to study them at the hospital or at home. That increased the partition rate to 49%. Finally, the two key things, we got extremely charming interviewers of the opposite sex, um, and we gave them gas coupons, which at the time in Italy was extremely desirable. Um, and we had some other, we had a letter from the mayor, they actually liked the mayor, that was a good thing. Uh, and we got the participation rate in controls up to 70%. It was a little easier to get cases because they were in the hospital. So uh, that's an example of what you have to do to um, improve your participation rate. And that effort took a year and cost a million dollars. Okay, epidemiologists worry about controls. And as I said, it can be expensive to get really good uh, controls. Um, you want them to be representative. Uh, having population controls lets you do some things computationally that normally you couldn't do. An example is you could calculate absolute rates as opposed to relative risks. Now, relative risks are very useful. So, for example, I can tell you that using hairspray increases the relative risk of lymphoma by uh, 1.4 to 1.6. That's a 40 to 60 percent increased rate. But is that rel relevant to an individual patient? No, because your absolute risk is still tiny. So. Uh, it's very important to understand the difference between absolute and relative uh, risk. Um, and I mentioned to you already that convenience controls are the least uh, desirable. 
So if you um, seek an epidemiologist as a consultant because you want to do a study, the kinds of questions they're going to ask you, uh, what's your study design? Where do you get your controls? Did you collect key covariates so you can take into account confounding and determine if your case and control populations are similar? Did you consider bias? What was your original hypothesis? And now that you have your data, are you looking at other hypotheses? If so, you really should be considering multiple comparisons in your statistical approach. Have you done power calculations so you know what kind of effect your study size permits you to detect? And what kind of validation did you do if you did biomarkers? The most common question epidemiologists get is, can you explain to me why my grandmother, who smoked all her life, ate bacon, outlived her doctors, how can you explain that? She had all these unhealthy lifestyle factors. Um, and one answer to this, there's a lot of different answers, is that epidemiology is concerned with probabilistic factors not deterministic, and that we know a lot of things that are associated with cancer, but we don't know if a given individual will have a specific outcome of interest. So risk is normally distributed, and you're always going to get people at the end of that distribution. OK, I'm going to touch on a few tools that epidemiologists use that are very useful. Um, one of them is cancer maps. and um, here, for example, is a map of uh, melanoma distribution. And what does this map tell you that would be really hard to figure out in any other way? As Soon as we looked at this map, what's obvious is that it has something to do with sun. Because as you go south, the rates of melanoma increase. Today, more sophisticated approaches, uh, geographic information systems based on satellite data, is used to study a wide variety of exposures. And this is increasingly common and used to, uh, for all sorts of um, studies in epidemiology. Um, SEER, Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results, covers about a quarter of the US population, 11 different states, and generates extremely detailed health statistics on cancer. And so this is a tool that um, anyone can use. You can go onto the SEER website and uh, download tables, cancer fact sheets. And it's very easy to actually do your own statistics and ask different questions um, if you want. And what kinds of things do you learn from SEER data? Uh, first, I'll show you a little uh, source of bias. So here are rates of cancer across different races from 1975 to 2000. And oh, look, in men, there's a big jump up in the cancer rates here in the early 90s. We don't see it in women. What happened there? And here's the answer. Uh, you can see the rates of uh, a variety of cancers are relatively flat, but prostate jumped up. And what happened right around this time? PSA screening. Um, was introduced. And so what happened was you had early detection of a variety of cancers during this period. And here's the distribution by uh, race. And uh, it's well known that African American men have higher rates than uh, white men. And you can see the distribution there. Here's another thing you can look at in SEER the difference between incidence and mortality. What does it mean if a specific cancer has a big difference between incidence and mortality? Well, one thing it means is that that particular cancer may be amenable to successful treatment. So it refers to childhood cancer, where a lot of cancers have a great um, success rate. For example, uh, childhood ALL, better than a 90% cure. OK, I said I'd touch on causation. And uh, epidemiologists have been concerned with how do you prove a cause. And Bradford Hill, uh, way back in the 60s, identified some criteria 
that are um, associated with true causal factors. One is you want a high relative risk or odds ratio. So if you have a risk of 1.2, uh, that may well be bias that's causing that. But if you have a risk of 12, uh, that tends to be something that you really want to think about as a true cause. You'd like whatever you identify as causal to be consistent. You'd like to see a dose response. If you have more of the cause, you'd like to have more of the cancer. The cause should precede the outcome temporally, or else it's not really a good idea that it's a cause. And finally, you would like biologic plausibility. Um, today, I'll at least mention that there are newer approaches to identifying causality. One of them is uh, mediation analysis, and this refers to when you have a uh, independent variable and a dependent variable, and you have an intermediary variable uh, in between them. And so uh, mediation analysis involves mathematical techniques to relate each to the other and try to infer something about cause. Uh, Mendelian randomization refers to using genetic markers to infer causality. So the way this works is Suppose um, we want to understand if tobacco really is a causal factor in lung cancer. Well, you can, if you have genes that predispose people to smoking, which through GWAS studies, in fact, we do have, what you can do is identify a group of those genes and give people with lung cancer a score based on those genes and determine if, in fact, they have more of those genes than uh, you'd expect. And in fact, when that kind of analysis is done, you do find evidence for causality with tobacco and lung cancer. But for other um, interesting associations, you don't find it. And a classical example of that is HDL cholesterol and heart disease. So um, drug companies have tried to develop um, drugs that actually raise HDL cholesterol, so it's thought to be protective. But in fact, when you do a Mendelian randomization analysis, you find no evidence for causality. So there's likely some other factor associated with both HDL cholesterol that has the uh, real effect. That might be exercise or it might be insulin resistance. Oh, molecular epidemiology. This refers to, in, in using biomarkers in epidemiology studies to um, help uh, define mechanisms. And I'll come back to molecular epidemiology in a minute. So here's just an example of one of the early cohort studies that showed a beautiful dose response between uh, cigarette smoke per day and rates of lung cancer. And I'm looking at the clock because I will end this talk uh, with at least 10 minutes before the end uh, to allow folks a chance to ask questions. Um, here's temporal, uh, temporal issues. So you can see that male smoking increased in the population uh, really decades before the rates of uh, lung cancer increased. The same thing with women. And here are animal studies in beagles that showed the preneoplastic changes in the bronchial epithelium um, that were similar to those uh, seen in humans in uh, dogs that were put on smoking machines. So this was a uh, early study which um, increased the biological plausibility that tobacco actually was the causal factor. You couldn't explain this by saying that the beagles had different personalities. And here's another great uh, epidemiologic study. These are cohorts where you had people that quit smoking and you could see that as uh, they quit smoking, uh, over time, the rates of lung cancer in a very consistent way across three different cohorts declined. Okay, so let me touch on some of epidemiology's accomplishments. Um, so in general, epidemiologists have been successful in identifying some of the general and specific causes of cancer. Uh, they have been advocates of public health. Um, I will touch on tobacco again. 
Um, the role of secondary tobacco smoke, I think, is really important. And I'm going to say a word about molecular epidemiology. So in DCEG, um, in addition to various studies in, area, in particular areas, often Congress or a paper will come out and NCI will call on experts in DCEG to uh, make a comment and to um, discuss different um, cancer causes. So that's happened with silicone breast implants, Chernobyl, uh, oral cancer and, and um, mouthwash, uh, abortion as a possible uh, causal factor in breast cancer, which it is not, cell phones, and for Fukushima, uh, folks in the radiation on, um, uh, epidemiology branch actually went over there to um, help uh, uh, construct studies to follow the population in terms of cancer risk. So what are the general risk factors for cancer? Uh, so it's, of course, age, environmental factors, genetics, and the combination. These are the general risks. And if the specific causes, tobacco um, is responsible for about a third of cancer. Um, diet certainly contributes, although it's highly problematic what the dietary causes of cancer are. And all other causes contribute to about a third. Um, it's kind of a rule of thumb in epidemiology that most cancer is due to the environment. And uh, that's because variation by geography and over time only are compatible with extrinsic environmental carcinogens. So there's a vast body of descriptive um, ecological uh, and analytical data that establishes this. And by the way, when I say the word analytic epidemiology, it refers to defined case control and cohort studies where confounders are taken into account. So here's a study that could be in the next talk on health disparities. But what this points out is that the highest, the ratio of the highest to the lowest relative risks across countries is dramatic. Um, so cancer risk factors really do vary greatly. And so this tends to point to environmental factors. Now, you might raise the question, well, how do you know it's not genetic? I mean, Asians have a different um, gene uh, pool to some degree than African Americans, Africans or uh, Caucasians. And in fact, we know that from migration studies. So when folks migrate from one study to the other, uh, one country to another, with the exception of a few cancers that I'll mention, um, they tend to rapidly assume the cancer rates of the new country. Our cancer maps help us implicate exposure. And a nice example um, was from one of the first cancer maps of lung cancer, which found this high risk area in Montana. And what was in this area but a copper smelting plant that was contaminated with arsenic. And this plant was actually removed, and when it was removed, the cancer rates um, improved, and that red area went away. Um, another example is uh, Zhenwei in China, where we actually have had studies for a few decades. And this is the highest risk area of uh, lung cancer in China. And when you go to Zhenwei, what do you find? You find indoor air pollution. Uh, you find beds that burn smoky coal that and uh, are poorly vented in the houses. So folks breathe in this smoke, and um, it's as good as smoking a lot of cigarettes. And it results in higher cancer rates. And studies, uh, when they remove these um, indoor sources of air pollution, uh, show that the rates of cancer dramatically uh, decline. Okay, so... Cigarettes are the big, uh, the big hitter. And I will say a word about tobacco that, um, you know, this is something you can look at later, but it is still the major cause of preventable uh, morbidity and mortality. And it's hard to believe, but in this century, it's still expected to cause hundreds of millions of deaths. So that's because in the developing world, uh, cigarettes are still 
heavily marketed in spite of the declines in the United States and Europe, in China and in India um, and other areas, uh, smoking is still going strong. Uh, smoking strongly associated with about seven cancers and uh, we still do studies. It's a nice study by Neil Friedman showing the association between smoking and bladder cancer risk. It takes decades to change behavior. So this is the Surgeon General's report um, in the late 60s, first studies of tobacco and cancer in the 50s, and the rate of smoking in the United States in adults has slowly declined. So it's about um, 12, 13% among adults today, but in certain areas, areas of the country, it's much higher. One of the effects of decline in the rate of smoking that maybe you're not aware of is that it was shown um, a decade later that environmental tobacco smoke was a risk factor for the spouses of smokers. And this in turn led to clean air laws that eliminated smoking on airplanes, public buildings, movies, hospitals, all those places where you would go in and have to breathe other people's smoke. So this was a terrific uh, public health boon, and incalculable numbers of lives have been saved and uh, based on this clean air legislation. So this is really something you can thank epidemiologists for. Um, I just wanted to mention that there's a lot of research today on smoking, and this is a paper we did just in the last year where we looked at the rates of light and intermittent smoking. And um, this is the fastest growing segment in smokers over the last 15 years. And this refers to smokers that smoke not every day and less than five uh, cigarettes per day. So what these smokers do is that they may get together with their friends or go to a bar and have a cigarette, or they may sneak out of the house because their spouse doesn't want them to smoke. But for whatever reason, they smoke intermittently. And these smokers have unique uh, characteristics. So there are differences by ethnic group, uh, by education, by age. Um, probably the biggest difference is that they're less dependent smokers. They have less nicotine dependency. So we followed this with a study, again, led by other investigators, that showed that even if you smoke a little bit, your all-cause mortality was sharply increased. So even smoking that small amount, and you'd expect this based on the data uh, on uh, spousal smoking or smoking in the workplace or smoking in the family that um, the rate of lung cancer was increased and so uh, is the rate of mortality. So smoking is still an ongoing concern even today. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on the other major risk factors for cancer. This is something you can look up on your own, but alcohol is number two after smoking associated with a variety of cancers. Um, sometimes epidemiologists do some good by proving that a particular factor is not associated with cancer. So it turns out that coffee drinking um, is... Uh, uh, actually good for you in many ways. You're, you're uh, good for your liver, um, good for cardiovascular endpoints, and uh, slightly less all-cause mortality. Uh, ionizing radiation is responsible for a variety of cancers. I'm not going to go into that. Um, a lot of studies from our group. I'm not going to go into non-ionizing radiation, um, tanning beds, um, uh, a lot of research has gone into infections and cancer. It's a major uh, etiologic factor in cancers, including newer infectious hypotheses. Um, uh, and I'm not going to go into the microbiome and how that has uh, now implicated some causes of cancer. Probably the best um, studied is Fusobacterium. And uh, a lot of studies are trying to nail down the association of this particular bug with colorectal cancer. Um, 
And in cervical cancer, uh, the, associ the differing association of different strains of HPV uh, with cancer is one of the factors that um, helped uh, really nail that down. And the earliest associations were with number of sexual partners. But as you got more specific and could identify HPV, the odds ratios grew up, uh, became higher with cervical cancer. And finally, occupation. There's a lot of um, occupational factors that are human carcinogens. And this is a politically difficult area because when you implicate something like diesel and lung cancer, um, there are um, supporters and uh, lobbying groups that complain to Congress, and then Congress calls you in and wants you to testify, and they want your data. And so they file Freedom of Information Act requests, and they uh, request your data and immediately reanalyze it to try to prove that you did it wrong. And in fact, looking at the data in some other way uh, shows that diesel exhaust is really good for you. So it's really important that you have well-funded groups that investigate particularly these environmental and occupational carcinogens. OK, what can go wrong? And first, I want to just mention some of the ordinary challenges that epidemiologists uh, face. And one of them is that there are substantial gaps in what we understand about um, environmental exposures and cancer. So um, some of those big international differences I showed you um, we don't understand. And so more work um, is needed. Um, and some exposures that are thought to be important are difficult or impossible to assess. And so I'll talk in the last uh, segment of this um, talk um, about how we get at some of those difficult exposures. So here's a, a favorite disease of mine, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, uh, the most common adult leukemia in the, in the Western world. Um, but we don't understand any extrinsic environmental cause for that leukemia. The major best understood uh, etiologic factors, age and family history. And about uh, 30 different SNPs have been associated with CLL, but we really don't have a great understanding of what the extrinsic uh, sources are. Um, dietary risk factors remain highly controversial. Uh, there are a few that have been implicated. But in general, um, for a lot of cancers that we're most interested in, um, we really have not nailed down the specific um, dietary causes. I'm going to brush by diet again uh, in a minute and go into this. Uh, one study we did uh, in our large case control study was on meat consumption. And so we did show that increasing rates of meat consumption, fresh meat or processed meat, was associated with um, increasing rates of lung cancer. But I would caution you that those studies are fraught with difficulty. And one reason is that in our questionnaire, we imagine that we're asking people precisely about their sources of meat consumption. But in fact, what they're really eating are a collection of other items that may bias the uh, assessment of meat. And so, uh, for example, uh, food questionnaires, is it the meat or the nitrates in the meat? Um, is it the high fructose corn syrup, in the big bolus of sugar that they're taking in? Um, what about uh, the load of carbohydrates? Uh, what about the, the uh, processed food um, that's, uh, that's in the bun or in the french fries? The, uh, the fat, uh, the glyphosate? Um, or maybe that person just that ate all this is not the most health conscious person and has other unmeasured confounders that were not covered in our study. So diet is a difficult uh, area. It's one of the more challenging areas. We have a lot left to do in that area. OK. Of course, epidemiologists have uh, delved into genetics increasingly. And uh, on the genetic side, we have challenges as well. One is that most of the genes in GWAS studies since about 2007 associated uh, with common cancers confer minimal incremental risk. 
They explain only a small portion of the variation. When you put them in risk models, they help a little bit, but they don't really uh, give you that much. How gene and environment work together is really poorly understood. So you'll see a lot about gene environment. And the dream with gene environment is that you have a high, that a certain exposure is only working in the presence of a certain gene. And if you knew that, if you could define that gene environment interaction really well, all you'd have to do is interrupt the gene or interrupt the exposure and you knock out a big portion of risk. Well, nice idea, but there are very few, if any, practical applications of that. Um, again, there could be a whole talk on gene environment interaction, which won't be this talk. And finally, for families, we've studied cancer families for a number of decades and used them to try to identify genes by classical methods like linkage analysis um, and more recently exome sequencing. And um, we found a few, but again, uh, it's difficult. So all cancer on some level is due to genetic changes, but you have to specify what you mean by genetic. Do you mean germline or somatic mutations in the tumor? Do you mean those population uh, kinds of genes that we discover in GWAS? Or do you mean major genes that we discover in families? And do you mean identifying our favorite candidate gene and looking for that specifically? Or do you mean the agnostic search across the whole genome? So here's examples of our cancer families where we have a, a group of lymphoproliferative malignancies in one kindred. And we have, for example, 50 of these families for CLL. Um, and these kinds of families have classically left, led to the cloning of different uh, tumor suppressor genes. Whereas in population studies, um, you had uh, only about five years ago, 240 disease loss. So I think that figure now in 2017 is uh, close to 7,000. Still, those genes explain a small component of risk. So I'll mention our study, EGLE, again quickly. We did a study, a case control study of lung cancer, um, driven by the idea that uh, in spite of the fact that we understand a lot about the cause of lung cancer, which is smoking, it's still the leading cause of cancer mortality in the United States. And treatment and screening uh, both pose very, very significant challenges. Um, so it was 10 years ago that we fielded uh, EGLE, this case control study of uh, 2,000 cases and 2,000 controls. One of the first things we showed was that um, family history was a risk factor. So we wanted to identify the genes after you adjust for pretty much every other known uh, lung cancer risk factor. Um, one of the features of this study is that we like to say it was a molecular uh, or integrative epidemiology study. And to explain this in a nutshell, originally what epidemiology did was it would identify a risk factor by a questionnaire and relate it to an outcome like a cancer and use statistical techniques to relate the exposure and disease. And on the basis of showing a correlation or um, some measure of statistical association, infer that, oh yes, tobacco is a risk factor. Well, the idea of molecular epidemiology is that you would also measure biomarkers. And so by measuring biomarkers, you could gain an additional amount of evidence. So maybe we would measure a tobacco marker in the blood, internal dose, and, and know the internal dose of tobacco. Or maybe we would measure a DNA adduct of tobacco or a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon uh, adduct. Uh, and in that way, in, uh, inform and gather further evidence of, on, the, on the, uh, uh, the sequence of causation. So adding biomarkers to investigate genes and mechanisms. And then more recently, um, integrative epidemiology, the idea that we can learn even more by looking at the behaviors that are related to exposure. And by looking at outcomes, we can understand something about the factors that makes somebody have a good or bad prognosis or a good or bad outcome. So in our case control study, 
uh, we actually got liquid nitrogen canisters into a number of our hospitals and would sit there and wait for the uh, surgeon to resect the tumor. And then the pathologist would take the tumor and uh, cut pieces and we'd have a piece of paper and mark where they came from and we'd get pieces of tumor to conduct these kinds of studies. We also uh, had a refined questionnaire. So in addition to asking people what they ate, we would assess things like doneness. So certain carcinogens like heterocyclic amines are related to the time and temperature of cooking. So understand if people would eat their steaks well done like this or more rare could be related to the levels of those carcinogens. So here are some of the instruments we included on the behavior side. The Fagerstrom test for nicotine dependency. I'll show you how we use that. Um, and then test um, questionnaires related to anxiety, depression, personality, um, and other factors. So what has uh, molecular epidemiology contributed? Uh, for example, we understand in part based on biomarker studies that HPV is the cause of 100% of cervical cancer. And that prevention is therefore possible with the vaccine. We understand that cutting down on smoking is ineffective in terms of reducing the rate of cancer because you compensate by the manner in which you inhale. And so uh, biomarker studies show that levels of carcinogens don't decline. And GWAS studies have been performed uh, for hundreds of conditions based on biomarker studies. So there's a lot more. This again could be a whole lecture. Consortia are commonly used in epidemiologic studies and groups have sprung up to um, expand data collection and reduce misclassification by using specialized instruments in those studies. Okay, so I'm gonna cover the last two sections rapidly. Um, what can go wrong? Um, I'm reminded of uh, Kuhn's classical work on the structure of scientific revolutions. And this work points out that our understanding of scientific paradigms doesn't change in a continuous matter, but tends to be discontinuous. The way Kuhn described it, basically um, models have to be overturned. So um, really what happens is the advocates for certain ways of thinking have to die before <laughs> anything changes. Now, a lot of us are skeptical about that. We think, no, I'm not that attached to my hypothesis. And the moment something new comes out, I'm going to look at the evidence objectively and adopt it. In fact, that's not what happens in practice. So let me give you the example of obesity. Obesity is strikingly increasing in the United States. It's also strikingly increasing worldwide. If you look at different countries, the rates are rising. This is overweight, this is obesity. 53% of the adult population in the United States, 21% um, is obese. All you have to do is walk into a Walmart and see the carts and you get an idea. Why are we concerned in, uh, in cancer? Uh, well, being overweight is associated with 13 kinds of cancer. What caused this? One way to trace this back to the cause is Ansel Keys. I don't want to put all the blame on this poor guy. He's the guy that invented K-rations. He did some of the very earliest dietary intervention studies, which are fascinating to read about today. But one thing he did was a um, multi-country study where he found an association between saturated fat and cardiovascular disease. And this led to recommendations to eat less fat, which if you have three macronutrients, fat, carbohydrates, and protein, you're invariably going to increase the amount of carbohydrate in the diet. So this led to USDA recommendations to eat um, less fat and eat more carbohydrates. And this led to institutions adopting these recommendations, which are still some degree adopted today by the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Foundation, et cetera. And the American public did indeed follow the recommendations, 
carb intake has gone up by over 30% and fat has gone down. Saturated fat went down. And what were the results of these interventions? Well, here's um, uh, an obesogenic diet that's given to fatten up rats. And in fact, our diet of 40% refined carbohydrates and 40% oil, which is a donut, um, is exactly what's um, given to rats. And it's what's currently the standard American diet. And this has resulted in a stark increase in obesity and overweight. However, when you do randomized clinical trials to look at the effect of reducing saturated fat, generally, these multi-million dollar studies have come up empty. So there's been no difference, pretty much, with a few exceptions um, in cardiovascular events, especially in mortality. So this intervention has not been particularly helpful, and there's a vast uh, literature on this now. However, what has happened is that diabetes in the United States has steadily increased. And if you look at diabetes prevalence, this 2012, um, up to 20%, even more of the adult population across the obesity belt, particularly, um, has diabetes, and a much higher proportion have prediabetes. So um, what's the cause? Well, dietary changes have to be number one. Uh, we could give a whole talk on the topic of light at night, but the idea of increasing light exposure may have something to do with obesity. And then there's a variety of other causes. I don't have time to go into these, but um, processed foods, uh, increasing uh, intake of nutritionally empty foods, uh, a less active population, obesogenic toxins, economic pressure. Poor people can only afford fast food and nutritionally poor food and less home cooking are some examples. Uh, light at night uh, hypothesis is a fascinating one. I don't have time to go into it, but there is some evidence that uh, light pollution at night and less exposure to light during the day disrupts our circadian rhythm and disrupted circadian rhythm. First effect of that is uh, weight gain. So um, before we developed diabetes, we developed insulin resistance for many decades. Um, and insulin resistance is associated with a variety of bad endpoints like Alzheimer's, um, overall mortality, and cancer mortality. So this is an area of current research uh, right now. OK, uh, that's all I can say about that. I will take two minutes to talk about what's next. Um, technology. So we use technology to capture some exposures that have previously been ex in inaccessible. Uh, we can improve misclassification. It's very critical to validate these. What can we get at that we couldn't before? Examples are sleep, physical activity, vital signs, circadian variation, social factors, location, where you are, and pulse oximetry. These are some examples relative, relevant to lung cancer. So sleep, many of you have Fitbit or some other kind of watch. Using your Fitbit, you can um, precisely quantitate the stages of sleep, REM sleep and non-REM sleep, extremely important. Uh, sleep is related to obesity in data from N. Haynes. If you sleep, this is our published work, less than six hours per night, your rate of uh, addiction goes up, your rate of diabetes goes up. Physical activity, likewise, um, can be tracked by actigraphy. Vital signs, very important. I don't have time to go into it. Uh, we're focusing a lot of our effort on circadian variation. Uh, social data, who you hang out with, is very, very important in terms of uh, a lot of traits. And finally, pulse ox. As most of you probably are aware, you can just put your finger on your phone and get your pulse ox. And pulse ox is uh, related to all-cause mortality. So um, it can be tracked easily in cohorts. 
Uh, this, all of this data, the epidemiologic data, genes, biomarkers, and technology is what we think will eventually create future improved risk models. So um, I think this is probably a good place to stop. Um, I'm leaving a little less time than I hoped I would, but I'm happy if there are a few questions. Thank you. Yes. So e-cigarettes um, are being tracked in the PATH study. Um, and newer, newer studies will try to follow them. But most of the classic cohorts, um, one of the problems is having to wait two decades for people to get different diseases. There are no questions in PLCO or AARP or any of those cohorts on e-cigarettes. Um, and the problem with doing case control studies where you can look at rapidly emerging risk factors is that it takes a while for them to have health endpoints. So it's going to be some time before we have good human epidemiology data. What we will have, though, is molecular epidemiology data. We will have biomarker data from PATH um, and some other studies like PATH that um, uh, give questionnaires to young people and the ones that are using these cigarettes, we will have biomarker studies on them in the next year or two. Yes? So, um, so I'm sorry, it wasn't polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, it was heterocyclic amines. And those are uh, specific, uh, to what's best studied is meat. Whether other proteins form them, I don't think they do. It's really an issue with uh, various kinds of meat. And the latest studies um, tend, even though these are established carcinogens, not show big risks uh, associated with doneness or the heterocyclic amines. It was a big thing uh, five, 10 years ago, and it's kind of not emerged as a dramatic risk factor uh, lately. So I put my um, email on the front page. If you have any questions that we didn't get to go in, I realized I covered a wide variety, not very deep. Uh, so if you have questions, please do email me and I'll try to get back at you. For announcements, uh, we're doing our pathology tour today at 6 o'clock. So for those of you who want to Go see the pathology facility in Building 10. We'll be meeting out in the hallway uh, at the end of the lecture. So our next speaker is Brid Ryan. She got her uh, undergraduate training in Ireland. She got her PhD at the University College of Dublin. And then in 2006, joined the NCI Cancer Prevention Fellowship Program. And she then worked as a postdoctoral fellow in Kurt Harris's lab, and she's now an NCI Earl Statman tenure track investigator. And she injured her leg, so she's going to have to sit down when she lectures. Yeah, apologies. So be kind to her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my apologies for that. Okay. All right. Okay, so as Terry said, my name is Bree Ryan, and I'm an investigator here at, um, at NCI. And I did my postdoc here, so I've been here for about 10 years now. Um, my lab studies lung cancer, and specifically lung cancer health disparities. So a lot of the talk today, you'll see some examples from lung cancer, but this is a talk really about, in a broader context, similar to what Neil was talking about in terms of cancer health disparities. So again, we'll touch on different themes. It's not all going to be lung cancer specific. But again, if I touch on something that you want more information on, or if you feel you just want to follow up with questions, my email address is here on the front. And as I said, I, I work here on, in Building 37 here on the main campus. All right, so um, the three main parts today of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about key, just, just give you an overview of what cancer health disparities in the US look like at the moment. In the second part, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the key factors that contribute to disparities. 
And then the third part, very briefly, we're just going to talk about where we are right now and what the uh, future focuses are in this area. All right. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of definitions. So there's a couple of slides like this, so bear, so bear with us. Throughout the talk, I often mention things like racial disparities or ethnic disparities, but I think it's very important at the beginning to define them and to note that both are important in this type of research. When we use the term race, what we're generally re referring to are biological differences between groups assumed to have different biogeographical ancestries or genetic makeup. So often when we talk about race, it's referring to ancestral or genetic factors. Ethnicity, while related, is distinct. And here what we're talking about, it's a multidimensional construct reflecting biological factors, geographical origins, historical influences, shared beliefs and customs that may or may not have a common genetic origin. And that is important. And as I mentioned, both of these are important in studying disparities research. So as I mentioned, one of the first things that I want to do is just give you a sense of what disparities look like in the US. So shown here on the um, graph on the left, you can see differences in life expectancy in the United States, specifically just based on race. And the first thing that you should hopefully appreciate is that for both men and women, in general, black men are t expected to live six and a half years shorter and black women about five years. And that's a really significant difference in life expectancy. Studies, of course, have been done to try and figure out what are the contributing factors to this. And while, yes, cardiovascular disease and issues contribute quite a big chunk to this differential um, uh, life expectancy, cancer also plays a very important role in this. And of course, cancer health disparities are the topic of the uh, presentation today. All right. Again, uh, addicted to uh, definitions here today, but just so that you know how the NCI defines a cancer health disparity. It's differences in the incidence, prevalence, mortality, and burden of cancer and or related adverse health outcomes that exist among specific populations within the United States. And specifically, the NCI and indeed many other organizations have noted that African Americans have the highest death rates from all lung cancers combined, including malignancies of the lung, colon, rectum, breast, prostate, and cervix, and that's of all racial groups in the United States. So that gives you a sense in some degree of the actual burden and scope of the problem. Okay, so these are incidence rates. This is just looking by men. This is data from the CDC. And what it's showing is the incidence of lung cancer by racial and ethnic group um, over a period of time. So this, this graph actually goes back to 1999. And what you can see is that of all groups in the United States, black men, and in this case men, but also women, have the highest um, mortality. Sorry, the highest incidence, excuse me. In addition, it's not just that the incidence is higher. What a lot of studies have now shown is that in general, the age at which the cancer is diagnosed is also earlier. So what's graphed on this, um, or what's shown here actually, is from colleagues of ours in uh, DCEG, from where Neil just presented. And what it's shown is on the right-hand side, African-Americans or blacks are expected to be diagnosed at a later age. But you can see the majority of cancers, including lung, are more likely to be diagnosed at an earlier age in African-Americans compared with European-Americans. So it's not just a higher burden, it's that the actual incidence is also diagnosed at an earlier time in their life. So what are the reasons for this? So there are several reasons that were proposed in, um, in this paper. And one of them is, of course, etiologic heterogeneity. So we know, for example, that the cause of a cancer can different across, can vary, I should say, across various groups. And so in that case, the cancer can occur at a different age. In addition, it could be related to the timing of the, or the intensity of the exposure. So one example here could be um, HPV exposure. So if you're exposed earlier, then the disease might be more likely to occur earlier. Or the same thing with tobacco, for example. If you start smoking earlier, one might imagine that you'd be diagnosed with that cancer earlier. And of course, there's other um, possibilities that we'll touch on a little bit later, looking at the timing and prevalence and frequency of early detection. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Because of this um, very strong observation that many cancers are in fact diagnosed at an earlier age amongst African Americans, the NCI has now organized the Early Onset Malignancy Initiative, and they're working with various centers throughout the United States to try and study this in more detail to see can we understand why these disparities occur 
and understanding it, what can we actually do to intervene? Something that's also been studied um, quite, or it's an, an area that's uh, been studied somewhat more, and again by some of our colleagues in DCED, um, including um, Lindsay Morton, is this idea of second cancers. So a lot of the studies to date that have described cancer health disparities, they're looking at primary cancers, so the first incidence of a cancer. But of late, people have been asking the question, well, what about second primaries? So as we have more and more cancer survivors, which of course is a good thing, it's also the field of cancer survivorship is very important because we need to follow those populations and try and understand what is their survivorship like? Are they at risk for second cancers? As you may know, a lot of treatments for um, cancer include radiation, and radiation itself is, of course, a risk factor for cancer. And some of the studies that have been conducted, this is just one example um, by, uh, her name has gone out of my head at the moment, but what they found in studying endometrial cancer and following those survivors is they looked to see what was the incidence of second cancers. And in that example there again, they also found disparities. So overall, if they looked at every cancer site, you can see that the standard incidence rate was 20%, um, there's a 20% increased standard incidence rate of all cancer types in, um, in the black participants, but it was uh, in fact even less in the whites. So more work obviously needs to be done in this area, but what this study points to is the importance of studying cancer health disparities, not just in the context of a primary cancer, but also within the context of secondary tumors as well. So we talked a little bit about incidence rates, but what about mortality? So here again shown um, for both men and women are data from the CDC showing that the mortality from cancer for both men and women is also much higher compared to all other racial and ethnic groups in the United States. So looking at this a little bit closer, this is data from um, JAMA Oncology a couple of years ago, and it's focusing specifically on the four main types of cancer, so breast, prostate, lung, and colorectal. And what it shows here is you can kind of get a sense of what the degree of the disparity looks like. So it's not just higher, but how much higher is it? And you can see that for prostate and breast cancer, this, the, the difference in mortality between European Americans and African Americans is quite high. Now, it's important to, overall, to emphasize that oftentimes when we do these studies, we look at a snapshot. It's one measure at a particular time. But what's equally important is to look to see how trends change over time. And I, obviously, in some of the work that Neil described, he took you through some of this. This is what's done in um, this type of analysis is what's done here. So this is looking at the um, mortality of patients with prostate cancer broken down by whether the participants were white, black, or Asian. And as you can see here, it shows that it looks at it over time and looks to see, are we doing any better? What you can see is that compared to people who were diagnosed between 1990 and 1994 to those who were diagnosed in 2005, 2009, the likelihood that these people will survive is much better. You can see it's improving over time. But you see for black patients, it's actually improving even more. And this is a good trend. This is what we want to see. However, there is data from breast cancer suggesting that we have seen the opposite trend. So in addition, the, the point of this slide is to say, while yes, it's important to look at what's happening right now, what's perhaps also equally as important is to look at how these trends vary over time, because it can also portend a new or an emerging um, disparity that you might want to look at and that you might want to address. Okay, so just like Neil had gone through in his talk, um, it's a very, many of these topics are very, very broad, and it certainly isn't possible to go, I could just give you a whole talk just on, you know, one of these factors or, you know, one of five factors within each of these. It's very, very complex. So the goal really of the presentation today is to give you a sense for the multifactorial nature of the problem. And it being multifactorial, of course, there are many, many disciplines that are required to research it to try and get a bit, a better picture of what's going on. I've broken it down into four. It could be, um, it could be many more groups. But at one level, um, the area that I mainly focus on, of course, is on genetic susceptibility and biology. That's my background, and they're the parts that we study. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But you cannot give a talk about cancer health disparities without acknowledging the huge importance of access to care, which we're going to discuss, the importance of exposures, behaviors, and lifestyle factors, again, just like Neil took you through in the previous hour, and also social determinants. And the idea is, of course, that each of these factors don't operate alone. They all interact together. 
And so while I myself not, may not study each of these individual factors, all the research that we do is acutely aware that all of these things are important. And where possible, we try and talk to our colleagues to share, the, to share our findings, and where possible, look for synergy within them. So in terms of factors that could contribute to disparities, so at a very sort of a, a, um, a high level picture, the first thing to note is that geography matters. So why does geography matter? This is just a picture of the United States broken down by state. And what it shows is for all cancers combined, just the fact that if depending on where you live, as you can see, the, the, the pale colors are low, is a low incidence of cancer, whereas the more intense blue colors reflect a higher incidence. And just based on geography within the United States, what you see is that there's a very large difference in the incidence rates of all cancers. There are many different factors that can contribute to this, but the point is that geography matters. So why does it matter and how could it matter? Well, a few of the things, of course, to mention is that, um, again, you could give an entire talk just on how socioeconomic status contributes to disparities, but it's a hugely important factor. So we know, for example, that a low socioeconomic status neighborhood, in addition to itself being a risk factor for many types of cancer, including lung, it also confers an additional incidence of mortality risk beyond an individual's socioeconomic status. So what does that mean? It means that the neighborhood that one lives in is an important determinant of cancer incidence rather than just your individual um, uh, socioeconomic status, and that's important. So how does it do that? Well, of course, pollution, again, as Neil talked about in his seminar, is a key cause of cancer disparities. And it's known that in certain communities that have a higher representation of African Americans within them, those areas also experience a higher burden of pollution. So these are all important factors. Depending on where you live, you may also have decreased access to preventative services. So these are things even as simple um, as smoking cessation services. Smoking the decreases that we've seen in cancer incidence over the past number of decades are hugely due to the decline in smoking in the United States. So smoking cessation has been and continues to be the number one thing that we can do to decrease the prevalence of cancer. So that's hands down. But depending on where you live, you may have more or less access to the types of services. So if you're more likely to live in an area where you have access to many um, health clinics or if you have access to a G, uh, what we call a primary care physician, for example, at those visits, they ask you, do you smoke? And if you said, I do smoke, they'll say, well, you know, you should stop smoking and here are some services where I can go and help you do that. The access to those types of resources is not uniform across the United States. We'll talk a little bit in a moment about rural and urban disparities, but they're very real factors that can contribute to an individual's health behaviors, but also their overall health themselves. In, in recent years, and especially I think in the last 12 to 18 months, this idea of studying and continuing to study in more detail rural and urban health disparities has really, um, really taken hold. Of course, it's been an area that's been studied for a long time, but I think there's an increasing recognition that there are very significant disparities in terms of both cancer incidence and mortality determined by whether the county that you live in is rural, obviously a low population, versus urban. And the studies now that have been shown that rural populations are more likely to have an increased cancer incidence, not of every cancer, so it's important to say that, but of certain cancers, but certainly overall as well in terms of mortality, there's certainly a higher burden. And often this can be because of an unequal burden of pollution. Again, we touched on that earlier. But also, in general, the socioeconomic status tends to be lower in rural areas. And for that, um, and again, the, we get to it again, but it go, also goes to access to healthcare. So both the financial access to healthcare, but also the geographical access to healthcare becomes exceptionally important. Um, this is just, again, some collective studies showing that rural cancer disparities have included higher rates of tobacco-associated cancers. This is primarily because the uh, prevalence of smoking in rural areas is higher than it is in urban areas. And again, that gets back to, you can see how it's intertwined because in general, there tends to be reduced access to preventative services. What's been seen recently, in fact, is while the temporal trends of HPV associated cancers has been somewhat stable in urban areas, we've actually started to see an increase of that 
in rural areas. And that is something that needs to be keenly monitored. And the reason that these things need to be monitored is based on this. It's all about impact. And that is, once we start to see trends emerge, if like, and just using this as an example, the tobacco-associated cancers, we know that access to tobacco cessation um, interventions is a proven effective method. But also in terms of HPV vaccinations, if we see there's an increasing trend well, from a policy perspective or from a public health perspective, that's an opportunity for intervention in a way to try and introduce um, ways to, uh, to prevent those cancers. So this is also just some recent work that was put out again by the CDC. And just to sort of take you through this, this is just a part of a bigger picture, but the reference here at the bottom shows you where the rest of the data are. But essentially, the, in, the more brown the color, the more urban the county or the area where the person lives. And again, just if you look at lung cancer overall, the incidence of lung cancer is much higher in rural areas. And we think that's largely because of the higher exposure to tobacco. But you see the, uh, a different thing for breast cancer. So again, what you actually start to see is an in, a higher increased, or sorry, a higher incidence of breast cancer in the more urban areas. And I put up this graph to make the point that I don't want to leave you with the impression that every cancer is higher and has a higher incidence of mortality in a rural area compared to an urban area. That's not the case. In general, yes, we see that there is a, there is a disparity in cancer in rural areas, but it is complex. So for anyone who has an interest in the area, um, this is actually a good primer to sort of get you interested in it. And it's very recent data, so some of the most uh, recent data that they have. So in the box here on the left, it shows incidence, and over here on the right, it shows um, the, the death or the mortality rate. So some of the studies as well that we have done, actually also in collaboration with the CDC, was, so as I mentioned, my lab is interested in lung cancer, we're interested in disparities. And one of the questions we had is, so we know that if you look at the entire population, the incidence of lung cancer varies from about 30 to 40% higher in African Americans compared to European Americans. But that very first picture that I showed you about geography shows a very um, mixed landscape, right? So depending on where you live, disparities could be higher or lower. So we wanted to try and do is in a more granular way, ask the question whether or not you were living in a rural area or an urban area by county level, determine whether this was their sort of hotspots of disparity, so to speak. And one of the things that we learned from the study is that whether it's for an adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma are just two specific subtypes of lung cancer. So this is a lung cancer study. But no matter what county we studied in the United States, the incidence of lung cancer was higher in African Americans compared to, to European Americans. That was the first observation. But the second thing that we learned is that the more rural your uh, location was in terms of where you lived, the higher the, dis the, higher the disparity. Now, this could be due to tobacco. Um, and in fact, we hypothesize that it's because of tobacco. But the issue is that well, there's two issues. The first is this type of study with the CDC. They collect all their data from cancer registries across the United States. And when they do that, you do not get individual level tobacco data. So it can't, the question can't be asked. The second thing is, I mentioned to you earlier that the incidence of, or sorry, the prevalence of smoking is higher in rural areas. But we as yet have no studies, at least that I've been able to find or that we're aware of, where it shows that the prevalence of smoking in rural areas is higher in African Americans compared to European Americans. We don't actually know that yet. But again, what it shows is that these types of studies enable us to look at disparities in a more granular way, to try and understand what's happening. And the reason that's important is because if there are preventative interventions that we can do, such as screening, and I'll talk about that later, then we know the areas and the people to whom we need to target it to. OK, I've mentioned tobacco quite a bit, um, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. Most of what I'm saying in terms of tobacco obviously applies to lung cancer. But as many of you will probably know from attending this uh, course already, is that tobacco just isn't associated with lung cancer. Pancreatic cancer, bladder cancer, many different types of cancer are associated, associated with tobacco exposure. So what I've shown up here, and I noticed that this is just cut off here at the end a little bit, but basically the incidence of lung cancer in men particularly in men, but uh, in the United States, is highest amongst African Americans. Now, we've just told you ad nauseum that smoking is the major cause of, um, of lung cancer. So when you look at tobacco, you'd expect to see quite a similar curve. Well, you don't. So what I've graphed here at the bottom is the incidence of heavy smoking. So this is, would be about 15 cigarettes per day or more. 
and you don't see the same trend as you see up here. So even though lung cancer incidence is higher in African Americans, they actually have the second to lowest prevalence of heavy smoking. So you might say, well, why is that? You could give, an, again, an entire lecture about how to measure smoking in epidemiological studies. And I know Neil has touched on this a little bit, too. But I'll try and go through some of the factors that might explain some of the disparity. Because there is, without question, a paradox between what we know about lung cancer and smoking, what we know about lung cancer disparities, and then the relationship between, um, or the triangle relationship between those two, um, or those three variables. So. Even though the prevalence of smoking is lower or about the same in African Americans compared with European Americans, the incidence of lung cancer is higher. We also know that African Americans tend to start smoking later in life. So that cumulative exposure by the time lung cancer develops is actually lower. You also remember I told you they actually are diagnosed earlier than European Americans. What's interesting is a very large study from a couple of years ago by Michael Kuhn and colleagues also showed that even if you look at never smokers, and these are people who will be defined as having smoked 100 or fewer cigarettes over their lifetime. They all, you, in that study, you can also see disparities. One of the biggest differences in tobacco exposure between European Americans and African Americans is the type of cigarette that's used here in the United States. So for various region, reasons, primarily um, uh, marketing reasons, about 70 to 80 percent of African Americans use menthol cigarettes. This compares to about 20 to 30 percent in the general population. So for a long time, people thought that perhaps the use of menthol cigarettes was actually associated with um, or contributed to the disparities. But in fact, it's been shown that the, the incidence of um, or the higher incidence of lung cancer does not seem to be related to disparities or does not seem to be related to menthol cigarettes. And what the studies have actually shown is that if you compare a menthol cigarette to a non-menthol cigarette, the incidence is actually about half. So it, it doesn't seem that menthol cigarettes contribute to disparities. And if anything, they confound it even more because of the point that I just mentioned. So we don't really understand it. What we do know, however, is that African Americans are less likely to quit smoking. And a lot of studies have now been conducted to um, and show that this seems to be primarily due to, or a lot of it seems to be due to the use of menthol cigarettes. So menthol cigarettes are basically traditional cigarettes, but they have a menthol, they have the, the compound menthol added to them. And what the menthol does essentially is that it causes a cooling sensation in the back of the throat. So a lot of the irritants that one might normally be exposed to when you smoke a cigarette, they are in a sense nullified. Um, and studies have shown that people who smoke menthol cigarettes are less likely to give up. So that could be perhaps one of the reasons that contribute to disparities. But it's important to show this is um, a study from um, uh, Chris Hyman and colleagues from, it's about 10 years or 11 years ago now. But it's a very similar study for the field because what it shows is that even if you break it down by the same number of cigarettes per day across all racial ethnic groups and by gender, what the graph shows is that even at the same tobacco exposure, African Americans actually have the highest lung cancer incidence for both men and also for women. Now, as you smoke more cigarettes, the difference or this, the, the magnitude of the difference is attenuated. And that's likely, to, again, due to the intense carcinogenicity, carcinogenicity of tobacco itself. Um, just before I go on, as I said, there are several things that, you know, many additional things that you could say about this topic. Um, but one of the, one of the, perhaps one of the most important is that even from the initial studies going back to, you know, Dahl and Pijo and all of those studies that showed that smoking was associated with lung cancer. There is a difference in the effect of, um, or the magnitude of the effect of duration of smoking versus intensity. So yes, both are associated with cancer risk, but in different, and it's not, they're not, um, they're not equal in a sense. And so what many studies have now shown is that the duration of tobacco exposure is more associated with lung cancer risk than the actual intensity. And so because African Americans are less likely to quit smoking, one of the hypotheses at the moment is that that's one of the factors that's driving the disparities. Again, in addition to trying to measure smoking in epidemiological studies, it's very difficult. Um, somebody, like studies have shown that those in low, economic, low, socio, low socioeconomic status are more likely to smoke more of the cigarette than somebody who you know, might have unlimited funds to buy, you know, 14 packs a day if, if they wanted to. 
So smoking tends to be more efficient, of a single cigarette tends to be more efficient than the poor. The reason that's important is because in an epidemiological study, if I ask you how many cigarettes do you smoke and you say 10 and this other person says 10, this one person might have smoked every single bit of that cigarette, whereas another person may only have smoked half of it. So the dose in terms of epidemiological studies is not equivalent. And Neil talked a little bit about this in his talk too, about you know, where things can go wrong in terms of measuring exposures. In terms of measuring tobacco, again, depending on how deeply somebody inhales into their lungs, you can get increased exposure. Whether you smoke first thing in the morning, I know Neil has done studies on this compared to you know, the cigarettes later on in the day, all of these things makes measuring smoking extremely complex. And so some of the studies that we're trying to do in lung cancer and disparities is try to untangle some of that complexity and at least measure smoking in a more granular way um, than we have been doing in some of the studies to date, with the idea that that might give us more insight into why we see this paradox between smoking, lung cancer, and disparities. Most of what I've talked about here is, of course, is in terms of incidence. But also it's important to remember um, and something that's not often appreciated is the fact that regular smoking after a cancer diagnosis, and not just for lung, so this is for many different types of cancer shown here, the, um, or smoking tobacco after a cancer diagnosis is also associated with an increased likelihood of death. So obviously the major effect size is shown here for lung, but for many um, cancer types, it's also been shown that smoking contributes to mortality. The reason this also is important is because I mentioned earlier, African Americans are less likely to quit tobacco use. So from a policy perspective and from an intervention perspective, what this suggests is that at the time of a cancer diagnosis, again, no matter what your cancer type is, it's another point of in intervention where um, nurse practitioners, public health officials, doctors, everybody in the medical stream, there's a point at which you can intervene to help that patient to give up smoking because it does make a difference. And that's regardless of race but it's just to show in terms of disparities, this is also a factor that could be contributing to some of the differences in mortality outcomes that we see. Okay, um, I kind of went through most of that already, so I'll just, uh, yeah, I can leave it there for now. Okay, so in terms of mortality, um, we mentioned earlier that across pretty much most cancer types in the United States, African Americans have a higher mortality. So why is this the case? One of the key drivers of an increased likelihood of death is um, the stage at which the cancer is diagnosed. And we know, again, this is work, this is the, the, the figures that's published every year from um, the American Cancer Society and it's updated. What it basically shows is that for most cancer types, the, there is a higher likelihood that a cancer will be diagnosed at a later stage among blacks and African Americans. And this is incredibly important because, the, as of course, as you know, the later a tumor is diagnosed, the fewer treatment options are available to you. And we see this trend year after year. Okay, so why are tumors diagnosed at a later stage? This is where we get into some of the other factors that I mentioned on that, on that slide where we looked at um, societal factors, social determinants of health, and also access to care. One of the key questions, of course, and this is related to access to care, is does screening matter? And the answer is yes, it does but perhaps only for some, at least at the moment, for some cancers. So let me explain. We do know that if you look at, there's studies that show that if you look at um, mammography screening in an equal access to care setting, that there's no differential use in uptake. Now, there are some situations where that is different. Um, we know that, again, even in equal access to care setting, for example, colorectal cancer screening is lower in African Americans in regions of Appalachia around the United States. We know that Yes, access to screening is low, but even when there is access, uptake is low. And we'll talk a little bit about uptake in, in a moment. Um, but it's also important to mention that yes, screening is important, but even in cancers where there is no validated screening modality, such as liver and esophagus, disparities also persist. And so it's important to remember that. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, I was talking about lung cancer. And so uh, for many cancer types, um, let me just go back. So for many cancer types, if there is a screening modality available, it could be access to care that determines whether or not you're able to use it, or it could be your own belief systems that determine whether or not you use it. But another key criterion that determines whether or not you have access to screening is whether or not you fall into the screening guidelines. So for lung cancer, the screening guidelines, um, there is now a validated method for lung cancer screening. It's called LDCT, low-dose CT screening. 
And it's been shown to reduce the mortality of lung cancer by about 20%. So it's a highly effective module for reducing mortality of lung cancer. Of course, for any screening modality, there are a set of criteria. For lung cancer, is you have to be a heavy smoker. So you have to smoke more than 30, have had more than 30 pack years of smoking. And you have to be aged between, uh, I think it's currently 55, and it varies a little bit here, but 55 and 74. So if you remember, though, I told you two key things earlier about lung cancer. First of all, the age at which African Americans are diagnosed is earlier. So already you're missing a group of people who are predominantly African American who were diagnosed earlier. And secondly, I showed you on that graph that they are significantly less likely to be heavy smokers. So the proportion of African Americans that you're going to include in your screening criteria is also lower. And this is just a study that we did using our um, case control study that pretty much highlights that. So here is the uh, United States Preventative Services Task Force recommendations for lung cancer screening. And this is the uh, criteria that CMS approved. But basically what it shows is that if you just use those criteria, African Americans are less likely to be included within the screening, uh, within the screening criteria. So it's important to make, and this has been shown for like colorectal cancer, I think breast and prostate cancer as well. And so it's led to a discussion about whether or not it's important to have population specific screening criteria or to, or to introduce other metrics that might be important, you know, other risk factors, family history, COPD, and just thinking of a few things in lung. Um, and in fact, there's a study done by colleagues in DCEG where they've shown that if you actually include some more risk factors, not just smoking exposure, what you can do is you will actually end up increasing the inclusion of more of these high-risk groups. And that's why it's important. Studies are now uh, being conducted, including some in our laboratory, to try and follow these, um, these specific screen detected cancers over time. Because if you have a certain population that is at high risk for lung cancer, such as African Americans, but they're proportionally excluded from screening, just by, even though introducing screening is a good thing, there could be an unintended consequence that you could actually lead to an increase of the disparities in mortality. And these are things that we are aware of and need to follow um, on an annual basis so that if these disparities do tend to, if they start to widen, that we can hopefully intervene in a timely fashion. Okay, so I mentioned this earlier. So access to care is very important. One of the key determinants of access to care is insurance status. And what this graph essentially shows is for many cancers, and there's other, others in this paper, but what it shows is that depending on whether you're um, insured, have access to Medicare, or have no insurance, that the green line basically shows people that have insurance. And for every cancer type, even those where there's a dismal survival, such as lung cancer, the outcomes are better amongst those that have insurance. So in terms of disparities in cancer mortality, one of the key messages I want you to take away with you is that access to care definitely matters. This slide brings it home a little bit more as well. This is just looking at lung cancer. This is looking at survival disparities between African Americans and European Americans in an equal access to care setting. In fact, this study was done just across the street at the Walter Reed Medical Center. And what it very clearly shows is that in this context, if everybody has the same access to care, there is no differences in survival. And it's a very clear, I think, and unequivocal message. But I also don't want you to leave you with the intent, with the, um, with the impression that for every cancer type, African Americans always do worse. That's not necessarily the case. And this is just one example here for multiple myeloma. This is an interesting cancer because African Americans are certainly more likely to develop the, um, the precursor lesion MGUS, but in, in populations where you actually have the cancers already being diagnosed, in that situation, African Americans actually tend to do a little bit better. So it's just important, it just want you to also be aware of that. Okay, talk a little bit more about access to care. This is a graph again going back to the, the, the um, in the entire United States. And what it shows is what's graphed is the oncologists, the number of oncologists per 100,000 residents by hospital service area. So again, the lighter colors represent either zero, which is none, if you think about that, access to no oncologists, versus access to about more than eight. As you can see, it varies quite dramatically across the US. And again, for any, you can, even just thinking in your mind, you can clearly see immediately how that could, uh, could influence both your access to care, but also your outcomes. 
access to care, so we've covered that, it's important. But I alluded to this a little bit earlier as well. It's not just access to care, but it's the utility and the uptake of that care. So again, focusing on lung cancer, this has been shown in many studies, and I'll cover one or two others. But in this report from 2010, and they went through, uh, this is uh, work by uh, Chris Lantham and colleagues, who's done a lot of work on this area. But what it shows is that even in, an, in a setting where there is somewhat equal access to care, for some cases, African Americans are less, this is an example for surgery and chemotherapy, but they're less likely to receive surgery and less likely to receive chemotherapy. And this is seen consistently in many studies. This is an example of colorectal cancer. Again, equal access to care, but African Americans with colon cancer were less likely, again, to receive surgery and chemotherapy as compared to European Americans. So we see this for many cancer types. And you might ask yourself, well, you know, why is this the case? One of the contributing factors is, if, and this is where the behavioral scientists come in to their own because they do a lot of study in this area. And again, this is, a, this is an example from lung cancer. But what it shows is that perceptions and behaviors are very important in matter. In terms of lung cancer, this is data from the National in, uh, Information Health Survey, uh, Trend Survey, and they found that, um, again, just going back to beliefs and symptoms. So a lot of people expected there to be symptoms associated with lung cancer before you would actually have a diagnosis. And of course, we know that's just not, not the case. And oftentimes, the symptoms for lung cancer, when they do appear, it's often, <coughs> excuse me, stage three or stage four. Um, and again, this sort of thing has been seen in many studies and for many cancer types. The personal belief systems to study and to understand are very complex, but we know that they play an important role. In addition, um, there's a lot of work that um, Peter Bach has done in New York to really study the patient and physician relationship and how, uh, I don't know if you have lectures on unconscious bias in, in this series, but I don't think so. But again, how, how different patients, but also providers can, um, just through an unconscious mechanism, bias the recommendations that are given to patients. So a lot of uh, uh, behavioral scientists are now studying those types of relationships. Um, there's also, of course, the issue of comorbid conditions. So I mentioned earlier that certain populations were less likely to undergo surgery or receive chemotherapy. But a lot of that is also related to comorbidities. So what makes you a good candidate for surgery might actually, um, in another patient, for example, BMI, your, your weight, um, uh, if you're in lung cancer, if you have emphysema or COPD. So the occurrence of comorbidities also varies across populations, and that can also contribute to um, the reasons why some patients might be more likely to undergo uh, chemotherapy or surgery. The other point to mention, so we've talked about access to care, it's important. We've talked about the access and the uptake of care. But the third rung of this very important ladder is that access to care does not mean equal access to good care. And so what do I mean by that? Again, it gets back a little bit maybe to uh, the graph that I showed you of the United States where you had access to oncologists. It doesn't mean that just because you have two areas that are blue and both areas have access to three oncologists that they're all exceptionally well trained, that they all went to Hopkins, and that in both areas they're all outstanding physicians. That's not always the case. And so what a lot of studies are now trying to delve into a little bit more and understand in how it can contribute to disparities is how access to care does not always mean access to good quality care. And so a lot of the public health and um, interventionist methods that are ongoing right now are trying to deal with that specific topic and try to understand it and appreciate it, uh, especially with all the conversations that there are about the Affordable Care Act and how it's going to impact access to care, it's important not to lose sight of the fact that what we're trying to do is to increase access to good quality and equal quality health care. That's often um, an unmentioned part of the debate, but a very important one. OK, so I've talked about many of the different parts of <coughs> the more societal factors that can contribute to cancer health disparities. But I also want to talk about a little bit in the last 15 minutes or so about how biology is also important. For some cancers, even in an equal access to care setting, even when you control for all the factors that we just talked about, there are differences in survival. And this is an example of just one graph I've put up. This is breast cancer, and it's showing that African Americans do worse than European Americans. 
So as I mentioned, it's not just breast cancer. There are some other cancers as well. I've shown them here. This is in a clinical trial setting. And what they've done is they've compared the outcomes between European Americans and African Americans across several cancer types. Basically, again, any number above one, and that's red, means it's significant. But if it's above one, it means that African Americans are more likely to do worse. And you can see here breast cancer, both premenopausal and postmenopausal, but you can also see here some other cancers, uh, such as prostate cancer and ovarian cancer, where we see the same thing. And so it, it started a field that sort of coincided with the explosion of technology and the ability to ask some of these questions about whether or not the biology of cancer is different across different populations. So when we think about biology, what do we really mean? So from our perspective, we're thinking about gene expression profiles, methylation. We're thinking about somatic mutations, germline genetics, uh, cell biology, systems biology, all the things that you can do to probe a tumor. So when we talk about biology, that's what we think about. So I'll give you a few examples and um, sort of highlights maybe from some of the literature in this area. For those of you who are familiar with prostate cancer, you might know that its aggressiveness is measured in terms of the Gleason score. So for example, here on the, on the left, you can see that a Gleason score of one is generally mostly normal cells, whereas in five, it's completely abnormal. And there's various scores that put this together um, as, a, as a linear scale. So the higher it is, the more aggressive your tumor is. And what's been found consistently across many different studies, including work done by Stefan Ams, who is a, um, a tenured investigator in our laboratory in CCR, what they found is that African-Americans tend to be, uh, once they're diagnosed with prostate cancer, it tends to be a more aggressive disease. And that's been found uh, in many studies. One of the other interesting things, and Neil touched on this a little bit in his talk when he talked about the genome-wide association studies. So all those studies that have been done to try and understand from a germline genetics perspective what factors contribute to the increased incidence. Well, we've known for quite a while now, and the GWAS studies confirmed it, that the region of AQ24 on the chromosome is associated with this increased uh, uh, risk of uh, many cancer types, but specifically prostate cancer. And what several studies have found now um, by uh, Chris Hyman and Friedman and other colleagues is that the region, the specific region AQ24 that seems to be particularly associated with prostate cancer that region is um, enriched in African-Americans. What they've been able to do now is to estimate that about 50% of the increased incidence that's seen amongst African-Americans with prostate cancer is actually due to this region. So there does seem to be at least a genetic reason or a germline reason why partially there's an increased incidence of prostate cancer in that population. And there's other region too on 17Q21, uh, which also seems to be contributing. What's interesting is that Isaac Powell and his colleagues um, in Detroit, what they have also shown is that this, uh, this region, this AQ24 region, and the alleles that are more common amongst African-American men, it also seems to be associated with that Gleason score that I'd mentioned a moment ago. So not only is it more likely to give rise to an increased incidence of prostate cancer, but it's more likely to give rise to the more aggressive form, the lethal form. When studying, so what I mentioned in the last couple of slides was studying about germline genetics. And this gets back to, or this slide, in a way I want to take you back a little bit to what we talked about at the beginning. We talked about race and we talked about ancestry, and, well, and race and ancestry and also ethnicity. So race in general talks about, um, or per, uh, per, pertains to genetic ancestry in part and where one comes from. What we know is that African-American populations in the United States are an admixed population. So when we're thinking about how and whether genetics contribute to cancer health disparities, we also need to very clearly consider whether or not there's a likelihood that the uh, population that we're looking at are admixed. So for example, I just talked about AQ24 being important from a germline perspective in terms of prostate cancer. Well, if you're looking at a homogeneous population, that's a very easy thing to consider. But if you're looking at a population where the degree of African ancestry varies, then in addition, that's also something that you need to consider in your study. So I want to give you a picture of what that looks like. So what I've graphed here, these are all participants in our case control study, about 1,500. What's shown in green is the, the, is the degree of West African ancestry. 
What's shown in blue is the degree of Native American ancestry. And then what's shown then in this uh, yellow color is the degree of European ancestry. All of the people on this graph have self-reported as being African American. But what you see is that the degree of European ancestry in these people varies quite a bit. Now, yes, certainly down here, one or two of the people, it just, you know, it could have been an error. There's clearly this person there who's 95% European ancestry. So yes, that could be, um, that could be a mistake in terms of how the data were recorded or something like that. But regardless, what the point shows is that across a single population, when we're studying African Americans in epidemiological studies, what it shows is that from a genetic perspective, when we're looking for things that are um, biologically and genetically contributing to disparities, we need to be aware of the underlying ancestry in our population and accordingly adjust for it. This is why earlier when we talked about the importance of studying not just race and ethnicity, this is one of those examples. Because there's this self-report of your ancestry and your ethnicity, which can often pertain to the, your behaviors and your lifestyle and your exposures and the, the societal determinants on your health. But also when we're talking about ancestry and genetics, we need to consider things like this. OK, and actually interesting in our study, what we did find is that an increase, increasing West African ancestry is, in fact, associated with lung cancer risk. And we see this only in um, men, not women. OK, on the graph that I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we had also measured in terms of both European ancestry and also African ancestry was Native American ancestry. And a very interesting study that was published a couple of years ago has shown that an increasing proportion of Native American ancestry is associated with increased risk of childhood acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We don't see that association for long. And there's been some other studies that have looked at it as well. So it seems to be somewhat specific. But what's also interesting, that, interesting, and it gives you an idea of how this is important from an intervention perspective, is that it's also been shown, shown that it's also related to um, therapeutic outcome. So in a study, what they found is that Children who had more than 10% Native American ancestry, they needed an additional round of chemotherapy in order to respond to their drug. So based on that finding, they're now able to um, stratify patients, in this case, patients with childhood acute lymphocytic leukemia, and to target those patients for an extra round of chemotherapy to see the same response. So what it does is it shows that ancestry in terms of disparity studies, um, or just clinical medicine, is important and is relevant. We've talked a little bit about germline genetics, but of course, somatic genetics are of also interest and importance. And this is something that we also study in our lab. But I'm going to give you an example here of a study in colorectal cancer. Obviously, um, and lung cancer is, is, is one of the similar examples. So when we do these kinds of studies, we're not looking for um, everything will not be different. In, this, in the case of lung cancer, smoking causes lung cancer. Most of the populations that develop lung cancer have smoking. So a lot of the genetic changes are going to be the same. A lot of the gene expression changes are going to be the same. But the focus of some of these studies is trying to understand what is similar and what is different. So in this situation here, um, what they found is that there's mutations specifically in EPHA6, which is an Ephrine-associated gene, and FLCN. And what they found is that, yes, they were low frequency. They occurred at about 3%, 4%, 5%, maybe 6%. But all those mutations were not found in populations of European ancestry. So you might ask yourself, so, so what? Well, maybe some of these mutations are actionable. Maybe some of these mutations could be targets for cancer vaccines. So there's a lot of work going on now with uh, PIK3C8, for example. This is a gene that is frequently mutated in many cancer types. And there's a lot of hotspot mutations. So a lot of research groups are trying to figure out, well, can we develop cancer vaccines towards those specific epitopes? Well, if those mutations are not present in one population, those vaccines will never work. So that is why um, uh, looking at racial differences in terms of somatic genetics is also very important. And this is, again, going back to prostate cancer, just to show you, uh, you might have heard of the Tempus erg. It's a very uh, common uh, fusion gene that's found in prostate cancer. Well, there are um, geographic and uh, racial differences in the prevalence of that oncogene. But not just ERG, but also in P10 and some other of, um, quite prevalent mutations. Uh, but the, the finding for ERG has been found, um, or has been known actually for quite a while. 
And it's not just in terms of European Americans and African Americans. The frequency of this mutation is also different in Asian populations. And again, in lung, we know that EGFR mutations are much more prevalent in populations of Asian descent. There's been some reports that it's different in African Americans and European Americans here in the United States, but it's not as different as it is in Asian populations. So by looking, and that's again one of the reasons that's important is because EGFR is an actionable mutation. And so patients that receive that therapy generally have um, a better outcome. So it's important not just to study and to try and identify new mutations, but also to understand what, how the uh, prevalence of them differs across populations. Getting then a little bit higher up in the order, so again, some of you might know this, but it's not just germline genetics or somatic genetics that are different. We also know that, again, in the era of um, technolog technological developments, that the molecular subtypes of breast cancer are also different across populations. So many of you will have heard of luminal, luminal A, luminal B, et cetera. But the basal type of breast cancer, the basal subtype, the one that's more likely to be ER negative, HER2 negative, and PR negative, is much more prevalent in populations of African descent than in, oh, sorry, than in European descent. So to show, uh, there we go. So this is the basal-like basal subtype here. As I said, it's very prevalent, especially in premenopausal African-American women. Um, but at least half, if not less, prevalent in um, other populations. And this is just one study, but it's been found again and again. And so in these types of studies, it's an observation, but then you ask yourself, why is that? Is it genetics? Is it exposures? Um, obviously, why it's different is important. But again, for breast cancer, the fact that it is different is also incredibly important. And again, the reason is, as I'm sure you've covered already in the course, because the triple negative types of breast, subtype of breast cancer is less amenable to the current therapeutic options that are out there at the moment. So that's one of the reasons why, in terms of, in terms of disparities, why biology matters. Um, this is a study from Jane says from a couple of years ago, but the, even though the, even though the subtype is more prevalent in African Americans. And it is a particularly poor um, and aggressive subtype to have. It's also important to remember, and this study shows it, is that when they look at the mortality outcomes across uh, the various subtypes of breast cancer, so it's not just triple negative, but if you look at all the various subtypes, there is still a disparity. So yes, triple negative is a very important part of the disparities in biology that you have between European Americans and African Americans. But regardless of that, African-American women, regardless of subtype, have a worse outcome. And that's also an important message that I want you to take away. This is an example of work that we have done in lung cancer. And basically what it shows is that when we look at, again, gene expression pathways. So in lung cancer, we don't have the same breakdown of molecular subtypes as you do in breast cancer. But what we do know is that, um, and again, this is similar to what's been seen in breast cancer and prostate and colon that a lot of the pathways that we see to be specifically dysregulated in African Americans are stem cell related, invasion related, and migration related. And we've seen that in other cancer types. Again, the point is to make that a lot of the gene expression changes that we see in lung cancer are similar in European Americans and African Americans. And we expect that to be the case because, um, again, as I said, smoking causes lung cancer. What we're trying to do is to understand what's different. And if it's different, can we in any way at all leverage it and target it? With the newer technologies that we have, this is data that was based on expression arrays. But of course, now we have RNA-seq. We have total RNA-seq where we can look at splice variants. We have small RNA-seq. We have prepam utr seq So we're using all of these techniques right now to get a much more granular view of biology. This is sort of like a high-level view of, yes, there are differences. But now what we really want to do is to understand exactly what those differences are. We're doing this in lung, and there are many other groups that are doing it in endometrial and breast, as I mentioned. Uh, Stefan Ams is doing work on both breast and prostate. But outside of NCI here, there are many other investigators across the US that are looking into uh, this area. I mentioned Stefan a moment ago. This is some of the work that he had done in prostate cancer, where again, he had shown, yes, there are, similar, there are many similarities. But where there are differences, the key differences that he had shown is that many of the pathways relate to inflammation. So I'd mentioned that one of the reasons that we study biology is because we want to understand from a, 
you know, from a targeting perspective in terms of a therapy, if there's a mutation, can we target it? If there's a specific pathway that seems to be addicted to specific oncogene, can we target it? But taking it back to a little step earlier, it's also important to remember that a lot of the work that we do in terms of biomarkers is based on tumor biology. And what do we use biomarkers for? We would do it to try and detect the tumor early, so before you even have a diagnosis, um, to predict risk, and in terms of prognosis. If the biology of a tumor is different, it follows, in some cases, that the biomarkers that we will use to detect the tumor will also be different, because most of the biomarkers that we study, they're coming from the tumor itself. And so again, some of the parallel studies that we do in our laboratory, in addition to just studying the tumor, of the, or sorry, the biology of the tumor, it's when looking at biomarkers, we also ask the question in terms of disparity. And again, we see things that are similar in terms of lung cancer inflammation markers. We see IL-6, IL-8, CRP. We see that in both populations. But we also see differences. And for example, this is just uh, two examples. We see IL-1 beta is only associated with risk in African Americans. The same with IL-10. We don't see it in European Americans. And so what this suggests is that as we move forward, and well, we have validated these results, but as we move forward to try and develop um, uh, biomarkers for the early diagnosis of cancer, again, we need to think of it in a population-specific way so that we have the highest accuracy for each population. Hopefully, as we've gone through the talk, I have, and again, in a very sort of a high-level way, pointed out to you that there are many different factors that contribute to disparities. We work on one specific area, it's focused on biology, but to try and understand it, and then in order to address it, there's many different factors that are involved, and similarly, there are many different um, uh, uh, disciplines that are needed to try, and, to try and address it. And it's extremely important to emphasize that, because even from a biology perspective, if we understand there are differences and we see you know, there's a drug that's actionable or you know, whatever, if we cannot implement that finding, and this is where intervention and behavioral scientists are extremely important, then it'll never reduce the disparity. So understanding the disparity is one thing, but coming up with ways to implement those findings are as much, if not more, important in terms of this kind of work. And this is just, again, it's, it's an oldish um, figure, actually, but I come back to it again and again, because I think it just highlights both the complexity of the problem, but also the role that um, different scientists, including scientists here at NIH, can play. So, at the end, I talked about, or at the beginning, I talked about how at the end we would just spend a moment talking about um, sort of what next. There's no question that the revolution in technology has really enabled us to delve deeper into the biology of disparities and try and understand what's similar, what's different, what's actionable, what's reproducible, and what, um, you know, how can it contribute to our understanding of the biology. With that, uh, several groups across the United States, this was just published a couple of, um, about a month or two ago, but the ASDR, ASCO, the American Cancer Society, and the NCI all put out a joint statement and published it in various different journals, but basically coming up with what they really, they took a hard look at the field and said, where are we now and where do we need to go? And they outlined several things that they thought, and I agree with, are important in terms of moving forward. So briefly, a lot of the work comes back to, and we talked a little bit about this earlier on, but defining and improving data measures for cancer disparities research. You could probably put you know, any epidemiological research discipline after this, because we talked about smoking earlier. If we can't very accurately define the exposure we're trying to measure, then we're not going to have a very um, refined um, and easily understandable uh, result. But again, in terms of disparities, this becomes particularly important. And one aspect of that, but by certainly not the only aspect, one aspect is what I talked about earlier in terms of ancestry informative markers. So trying to understand the elements of genetic ancestry that contribute to disparities and also the, um, the more ethnic related factors as well. So that's sort of one of the things. Um, they also talked, of course, about you know, addressing disparities in cancer incidence, addressing disparities in cancer survival. A huge part of this is access to care, it's access to the same care, and is coming up with interventionist ways to ensure that everybody uses the same care to the same way. But in addition, from some of the work that we're doing, it also, there's suggestions that biology is also important. And I talked about this earlier too, just to re-emphasize it, it's improving community engagement in cancer research. So it's sort of a broad statement, but it goes back again to the intervention. And so 
Um, like the HPV vaccine is one example. We have this phenomenally successful cancer preventative um, uh, tool, but if people don't use it, it's not actually going to be effective. So for populations that don't use it, it's trying to understand why that is, and then in trying to encourage them and engaging with them to um, try and increase uptake. And then this last part is, you know, considers redesigning clinical trials to acknowledge and address cancer disparities. So I'll give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> you probably know um, already that the participation of African Americans in clinical trials is very low, even to begin with, right, before we do anything else. So there's a lot of efforts ongoing now to try and understand why that is the case and trying to come up with interventions so we can improve it. The reason that's important is hopefully clear to you because we know the biology is different for many of these cancers. So we need to ensure that African Americans are appropriately represented. In fact, any racial minority group in the US is appropriately represented so that if there are differences in outcome by race, that we can, we can actually analyze it. And in fact, the NCI has a mandated rule that if you conduct an NCI clinical trial, you must, in your analysis afterwards, stratify by race to try and figure out if there are racial differences in response. Of course, the problem there is power. If you don't have enough people enrolled, you won't be able to find the answer. It's incredibly important. I, I'm still struck with a talk that I was at at ACR last year where they were talking about immunotherapy, which of course everybody is talking about for good reason. But they were presenting the results with a New England Journal paper and it was dramatic, very dramatic effect in lung cancer at the time. And of course, I was sitting there thinking, you know, well, what was, how did it work equally in all populations from other work that we do with this suggestion that maybe it won't in European Americans and African Americans. But I was just curious, like, what were the data? And there was one African American enrolled in that trial. So you just have no way to answer the question. So because we know African Americans are less likely to enroll in trials, because we know biology is different, and we know that there may be differences in outcome, there is an onus for us at a time when there's a massive revolution that can actually increase um, like tumors that never responded before. There's now the likelihood that people will respond. There is a very important onus on us to make sure that we can increase the representation to ask the question at least. And so there's, again, it's a whole area trying to, um, to think about this area. And it is exceptionally important for many of the reasons that I just described. So I'm going to finish there. And the last slide basically rec recapitulates a lot of what I've said. My email address is at the beginning um, of the slide. Again, as I said, my main focus is on lung cancer. But if your interest or questions relate to other cancer types, I, I have a lot of colleagues who work in different areas. And I'd be certainly happy to redirect you to them if I can't answer your questions. So thanks very much for your attention. I'll take a couple of questions if time, and if not, we'll follow up afterwards.